harvest time can be more abstract for us living in the 21st century as we do. There's a lot of mechanization and there's a lot of separation between us and the process of growing food. And why I think it's still worth doing something like harvest, and I've got colleagues who think there's not much point in it because we're too far removed. But for me, that's one of the reasons to do something that makes us mindful of the fruits of the earth. Because as humans, the danger is always that we either look to become or do become over time um, a bit conceited and self-sufficient, as if we're able to do all of this with our own ingenuity. But it's helpful to remember how reliant we are on not just nature and the cycles, but particularly the God who created all of that and continues to give us these. The uh, reformed position and the nature of God is that all goodness flows out of him. And if there were no God, then we wouldn't be able to taste or experience any goodness on the earth at all. He continues to sustain it and bless us with it. And I love the Psalms for doing that because essentially they're poetry. They're teaching us about, as any good poetry does, the overflow and the expression of people's hearts as they're looking to put into words the beauty and the power of what they're seeing before them and, and connecting that back to God. And we think the psalm was probably some sort of harvest festival psalm. There are several of them in the Old Testament. If you read through Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you'll find the uh, festival of the first fruits where they were to bring in whatever came up first from the top of the ground and bring that in and celebrate and remember that it was from God. But then even the likes of the festival of shelters, which comes later in the year, is very closely tied to whatever God provides in the land. They're meant to mark and represent that in their rituals. And so in this psalm, the context is the temple and looking at the awesome deeds that God has done, the connection between God as creator and everything that they're experiencing in the world, but perhaps more especially the universal nature of that. The fact that this goodness is not just for those who are in the club, who are writing the psalm, who are enjoying God's provision at that moment. There's an eye, as with anything you find that has a hint of the gospel in the Bible, towards the bigger picture and towards the goodness of God going worldwide, if you like. So this morning, as you'll see, and you've got your little handouts, I want to look at that under three headings. I want to look at, firstly, the theme of covering by God's grace, because that's, that's a really good way to understand God's grace. And, and the psalmist absolutely brings that out beautifully. Um, and then I want to look at how God as creator covers the creation with provision, because that's also a theme. And lastly, how God covers the world in his power. So being covered with God's grace, the psalmist opens with praise awaits you, our God in Zion. To you, our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer our prayer, all people will come. And when we were overwhelmed by our sins, you forgave our transgressions. The psalmist is walking through something that continues to be common to us. Every human being who looks to have a connection with uh, the deity, with God, whether it is the God of the Bible and of the Hebrews or any other God, it's the most natural human question in the world to go, what can I bring or what should I bring? What does God expect or require of me? What can I, if, if God is a being that is far above our understanding and our reality and experience, what can I bring in approaching them to kind of bridge that gap between me and them? Do I need to bring certain kinds of rituals or certain kinds of prayers to make me acceptable to them? And a lot of religion, uh, our own included, is about that, is about, if you like, uh, preparing your heart, getting your posture in terms of being in the right frame of mind for worship. But the psalmist picks up on a problem here because as well as the, the gifts and the vows and the prayers and the like, the stuff of what we do for God, they're bringing in all of that. That's very human. But then they're also bringing something else to the table. We were overwhelmed by our sins and transgressions. And the psalmist gets right to the heart of this 
other universal human experience that for anybody who is human looking to come to God, they're going to bring themselves and they're going to bring perhaps a less pleasant part of themselves. They're going to come and bring this awareness that they are a sinner and that they have missed the mark. That's what transgression in the Hebrew literally means, to, to miss the mark, to aim at something and to go off. And I find that helpful because that's something that happens with me. And I think we can all relate to that. And so what do you do with that? Well, because then there's a problem because the God that they're worshiping is high and sovereign and holy and isn't like that. And there's that sense of, you know, when you're, um, when you, whenever you see, I see it sometimes when Autumn meets her favorite footballers, is that you go a bit giddy because you're in the presence of greatness. Um, if any of you have ever been blessed enough to meet the royal family, then there can sometimes be that little bit sense of awe and grandeur. Uh, that's the sense of coming into the, the presence of God that the psalmist is bringing. And they're bringing their kind of sins and feelings and transgressions. And the answer is that he says, you forgave our transgressions. Now, that might seem so simple and basic to Christianity, but I want to slow down on it because the way the psalmist phrases it is so wonderful and gets us into, if you like, the mechanics of what God does. The, the word for forgive um, is to, similar to, to make atonement for, or my favorite kind of concrete expression of it in the Bible is blotted out got rid of entirely. Uh, do you know the experience of when you, if you go to now it is, if you go to buy a carpet and they say, this is brilliant, this one, you can spill anything on it, bleach, and it won't, it'll be fine because we've got superior technology and you soon find out that that's a very, very bold sales claim, um, especially if some item brew or something goes on it. And and then you go to the, the supermarket and you get the best, you know, whatever vanish is brought out in the last and it's got more gold stickers on it that says, you know, every company trusts us and you get that. And it almost gets it out. But you know, you know that something that there was some item brew there and you know exactly what it was and it never goes away completely. Um, that's been a perennial human problem with the issue of their own sense of guilt, of failing, of sin, of not being good enough, of can I be accepted, or even just can I be wholly seen for all that I am and somehow loved. And the beauty of the picture of grace, in, in even in, all the way back in the Psalms and the Hebrew Bible is what God does is he takes everything that makes you in any way less than perfect and he blots it out and removes it completely. So it's as though it doesn't and never did exist. That's, that's a beautiful picture. And I think that's something that we all need and can relate to that sense of, if only we could grasp that. And the psalmist is praising him because you're doing that. That's the first good thing that if you like, this is a people and we are a people and we are all able to be a people and you can be a person who knows what it is to come to God. And by the simple act of approaching him and asking him for his grace, he'll blot everything out that you've ever done wrong, that you've ever considered would make you unacceptable to God or to others. And he gives you that newness because he quite literally covers us with his grace. So we stand in it. We enjoy it. It is part of who we are now. We are people covered by the grace of God with every, every stain blotted out. And then he covers the creation with his providence, with his goodness, with his provision. And that's really probably what we're, we mostly think about at harvest. Look at some of the ways that the psalmist explains this. The whole earth is filled with your wonders. And so God is controlling the cycle of evening and morning. I love this picture in verse nine. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly to provide the people with corn. And so you ordain it. And then you drench the furrows and level the ridges and you soften that with showers and bless its crops. The picture is that the psalmist is imagining God as the most careful and uh, intimate and invested farmer that you've ever seen. 
or well, crofter if you're from my part of the world, but who really cares and has that connection to the land and to all the, the created beings that are within it. Now, th this was mind blowing in the time that it's written because the ancient people, around the time the Psalms are written, there's kind of competition for who's God. Uh, there's another uh, ancient deity called Baal. And a lot of the peoples around Israel at the time, and even some Israelites, thought that they, they kind of wanted to hedge their bets. They thought Baal is the one who gives uh, grain harvests and crops to grow. So what you need to do is you need to go to Baal and you need to get your vows and prayers into him and sacrifices into him and he'll get the grain. But then Yahweh, he does the, the other stuff. You know, he's given us his word and, and the truth and so on. And this is a real confession of faith saying, actually, we just believe there's one God and he's in control of all of it. But not only is he in control of it, we're seeing some of his love and his nature because he's caring for all of it. All of the world and the cycles and the rhythms of creation and the grain coming and the streams that flow, all of that is being ordained by the hand of God in order to bless us and give this experience of creation. And it's a picture of abundance of overflow of fruitfulness a bit like I was sharing with the children there is actually we still live in a world of plenty and of overflow and, and, and the problem is that the creation can't support, support or sustain life it's the other bits of the bible that we need to go to to see what the human problem is that often gets in the way of providing what everyone needs. The meadows in verse 13 are covered with flocks and the valleys are mantled with corn and they shout for joy and sing. Here's a really lovely thing about creation. When it's doing what it was supposed to do, when it's within its intended purpose, it's almost performing a worship act. That's the pictures that the Psalms have, that it's giving praise to God by its very nature because it's doing what the creator made it to do. And in that sense, you and I are the same. When we live with connection to God and with that sense of purpose, when we have gratitude for all he's given us and we have an awareness of that every good thing comes to us from him, then we don't have to do anything extravagant in terms of offering massive long prayers or very performative worship because life becomes worship when we have that awareness and gratitude towards God. And then all God asks us, is if we know what it is to be covered by his grace, to have that profound experience and to have the gratitude of him giving us all that we have and, and what we need, then it's to be fruitful because you and I are part of God's creation too. And he likes us to produce fruit the way everything else in the creation does. Now, this is something I kind of stumbled on this week. Where can you think of in, in the Bible that talks about us producing fruit? Jesus talks about it. Jesus used metaphors from the natural world all the time, particularly to do with our soul and with our connection to God. And here's where I think we're supposed to end up if we read about the goodness of creation is that our thankfulness for all of it should lift our eyes up to heaven and thanks to God, but then lift our eyes outwards in producing fruit. You see, it's not just the natural world that gives things that when it's working in harmony with what it was meant to do, that it makes this world a better place. You and I can be that too. Apostle Paul calls it the fruit or the produce of the spirit love, joy, peace, faithfulness, gentleness, patience, kindness, self-control. And all of those things are stuff that you can only do when you're in connection to others and you get to practice and perform with others. And you're not doing it to earn God's love because you've already done that because he's covered you with his grace, but you are doing it because the stuff he's put into you by giving you that grace naturally comes up and produces fruit that is pleasing and beautiful to other people. And they're able to have a better experience of God's creation because of you and me. And so the whole earth is covered with God's provision. And that includes you and me and you and I are part of God's provision for the world within us. 
And what a beautiful expression of that that we're able to take part in every year by looking to overflow with what we have so that others shall be blessed uh, in partnership with the likes of the food banks. Those are just small images of what it is to be living a life of taking part in the fruitfulness of God's creation. And then lastly, God has covered the world with his power. And this is more challenging. And I think in some sense requires perhaps the most faith. We read in verse eight that the whole earth is filled with your wonders, but then also the expansiveness of God's power. You answered us with awesome and righteous deeds. He's talking about Israel when they've been in a tight spot. Have you ever been in a tight spot and prayed to God and something's happened? So they've had that experience as a nation again and again. God, our savior. But then he's naturally expanding his horizons to the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. The hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. It's very common for us today, as well as being disconnected quite often from the cycle of nature and produce, to think that our life and any religious expression that we have also falls into categories. So we've got our stuff that we come here and we do on Sunday, and that's kind of where God's in charge. And then Keir Starmer's in charge, or John Swinney for most of the rest of the week, and um, whether we like them to be or not. And whatever else, if we're at work, our boss is in charge. And it's, it's quite an alien concept, I think, for many of us to think actually God is ruling over the entire creation. And God even it talks here about the roaring of the seas and the turmoil of the nations. Do any of you like me think that you, you cannot escape uh, in the landscape that we're in, the turmoil of nations coming into your doorstep and your phone and your newsfeed? It's impossible. And it's something we worry about and we lose sleep over sometimes. And it's something that's a real reality for so many displaced people in the world. And what we are given is a sense that that is not off God's radar. That the nations and the way they interact with each other and international relations are, are all known to God. And we are, as the people of God, are given a confessional hope and faith that that will all come about to an all come good in order to glorify God and for his kingdom to cover the whole world with his love, with his peace, with his justice. And we don't see that yet, but the key I would say is in the gospel because the psalmist calls God their savior, the hope of all the earth. What does it mean for God through Jesus Christ to be the hope of all peoples? The gospel has gone all over the world and has exploded since the time of Jesus being on earth. But that work is far from done. And you and I, however small a part we play in it, we know what it is to take part in something that we know goes across the whole world. When we're taking our part in our local church and in the kingdom of God and its initiatives. Because it quite literally is the hope of the world. Because the gospel, as, as God gives it to us, removes all barriers. It shows us that all of us are part of God's creation. And there is nothing really that divides us from our neighbor because we are made in the image of God. And because every people group and tribe and nation and tongue has the exact same right and access to the gospel as you and I have had. And so it takes away any kind of conceit or pride or hubris or um, racial superiority you see, these are all issues which absolutely carve the world up. The answer is here. We need to have faith to continue to see and believe it and to pray for the gospel to go to the ends of the earth and to do that work so that we live and look towards the day where the glory of God is seen from one sea to another and where God is in reality the hope of all the nations. And so God has clothed us with something so good and precious in his grace, but he's also given us the gift of existing in this creation, which he has made and continues to sustain by his own power. 
but we don't just exist. We produce fruitfulness as part of that, as much as we enjoy the fruitfulness of it too. But the great hope that we have, whether it's looking towards uh, wo world hunger or food insecurity or lack of resources or lack of education or a uh, lack of safety and conflict, is that that gospel of peace and the grace of God covering us and forgiving us and accepting us and the love that that can naturally give us for our neighbor, that that'll continue to flood and fill the earth as is God's intention. May he bless his word to us this morning. Amen.